I would not describe Bitcoin as a as an NFT. Uh, instead, I would describe it as out of all the cryptocurrencies that exist. Hello, everyone. Today, our guests are financial experts Lynn Alden and George Selgin, debating about the merits and demerits of Bitcoin as sound money. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. But let me step back a bit and try to get to the main point I was driving at in that tweet of my own. Uh, the whole idea of money is uh, to get around the barter problem. And that means that uh, with barter, you've got something you want to sell, something you want to get hold of, and uh, you've got to look around for somebody who has what you've got and, and uh, offers uh, uh, to take what you have. And that isn't always very easy. And the principal idea of money, what makes something money, is that for whatever reason, everybody's willing to accept it in an exchange at some price for whatever they've got to get rid of. And when you have that, that means that you don't have any search costs. When you go around, uh, you find somebody who has what, what you want, you can, with high probability, you can trade with that person uh, for this substance that everybody supposedly or most everybody agrees to accept. Okay. So that's the whole idea of money. That's what makes something money. It's generally accepted or commonly accepted in exchange. Now, the test for whether something's money is therefore whether you can go shopping with it with low search costs where you can pretty much go into any shop or online uh, these days and uh, whatever you're looking for, if you're equipped with this stuff, the seller is going to take it. My point about Bitcoin is very simple. It's that in most places, the vast majority of sellers aren't going to take it from you, or to put it perhaps a little bit more cleanly, there's something else, some other asset that they are uh, more likely, much more likely to accept. And these days, that's usually uh, whatever the local fiat money is. And just one more point. Uh, now, what Lynn said was that... Uh, Bitcoin is high on the saleability list relative to all the other non-fiat currencies that uh, are in use in the world. In any particular place, it's high on the list of alternatives. And that's true. But that still can uh, be consistent where there being a big gap between its acceptability and the number of merchants and sellers who will trade for it and the number who will trade for the local fiat money. And so in that sense, these two tweets are reconcilable. Okay. Finally, I do think Bitcoin uh, has made a lot of gains in acceptability, certainly since it was introduced. So my statement doesn't necessarily exclude it becoming money in more places in the future. And the way I'd phrase it is that, you know, as you put it, basically, you want to solve the barter problem. And the shortcoming of fiat currencies is that you don't, you only solve the barter problem in a local sense, right? So, for example, in Egypt, Egyptian pounds solve the barter problem. It's a widely accepted medium of exchange there. Um, but if you're in Canada, uh, e Egypt pounds are a, a terrible medium of exchange. Basically, they're only money in Egypt, maybe a couple border countries. You can get some degree of uh, saleability there. And the saleability rapidly falls away outside of the local monopoly so when you have 180 different different currencies i think something like 130 of them are free floating um the other ones are, are pegged and therefore i mean pegs can break uh you basically have a barter system globally uh and only a handful of of you know monies that basically tie them together you have the global reserve currency it used to be uh you know british pounds now it's dollars uh you have gold coins if you bring a gold coin with you you can pretty much go anywhere and my argument is essentially that if you look at in a global sense, global bearer assets, you know, what are what are the top 10 monies that you could bring with you that would be uh, among the easiest to either get a vendor to, you know, sell you something for them, or at least that you could then convert into the local, uh, uh, you know, system fairly easily, right? So for example, I, I mean, I have Norwegian kroner and Egyptian pounds in New Jersey, and you know, basically, they're they're less saleable here than bitcoins, for example, and that that's true for a lot of places, sub suburbs and, and urban centers around the world. Um, even though, of course, they're both highly saleable, 
uh, in their host jurisdictions, uh, which is essentially an, an artificial monopoly. Uh, but that's just that's the way that's the current technology stack that the world uses uh, for lack of some uh, a lack of something better. And so my my overall view is that, uh, and it doesn't really disagree with George in that sense, is that it's it's an emerging money. It's not as it's not as saleable as say gold coins or physical cash dollars globally, for example. But I would say that the trend is very much up, and that it's already. I mean, you could look at again those hundred eighty fiat currencies, and then you know a bunch of other commodities. It's it's you know it's in the I'd argue the top ten, uh, even after only a fourteen year lifespan, uh, let alone having a good trajectory. And it also comes with unique characteristics. For example, uh, what makes it interesting is money is that um, you know if you're if you're trying to move money globally, right? If you try to bring gold through an airport, try to bring physical cash dollars through an airport, you're going to get all these checkpoints, all these ways to stop you, capital controls. The interesting thing about Bitcoin as a technology stack is you can memorize 12 words in your head and, you know, you're basically you have like your slot on this decentralized cloud of money that you can then go around the world and eventually reconstruct your ability to access that. Right. Or you can just send it to people, uh, you know, peer to peer in a way that it's, it's challenging to stop. Um, uh, you know, there are regulations and things that can try to slow it down around the margins, the fiat on and off ramps. But the actual network itself is rather interesting and, and kind of offers novel characteristics that a lot of other monies, you know, basically have been able to offer. Do have things that are stores of value that aren't money, and you have things that are units of account that aren't money, but you don't have things that are generally accepted media of exchange that aren't money. Anywhere where you have something that most people accept in payment of goods and services, that's money, whether it's, whether it's a good store of value or not. And of course, that's why we can have monies that are crummy stores of value, as as we all know, <laughs> have existed and exist today in some mm -hmm. countries. Uh, and all fiat monies are mediocre stores of value, but nobody says, oh, therefore, they're not money because store value is one of the three. Fun nobody says that and that nobody believes it. So those textbooks are misleading when they use these three things, state these three functions as if, as if they were equally essential. And I think it's very important. The general medium of exchange function, that's the one that rules the roost. And so if we want to ask whether Bitcoin is serving as money in any particular place, and Lynn makes a very important point, most monies are not money everywhere. They're money in certain places. And so we can ask the same question of Bitcoin, where is it money? There are places where it, it qualifies more than in others for sure Bit, bitcoin b and so i i, I instead of you money is more of like a spectrum where uh, i i generally would prefer that three-part view of money i think that's a i think that's a more accurate way of actually assessing the moneyness of something um because for example you can look at say art like a picasso painting right that's a store of value right but it's not liquid it's not it's not fungible uh it's a rather poor form of money yes. uh as you know but it's but it's a store of value. It's a bare. It's you know. It's a bare asset. You you can hold the Picasso. You can self custody it. Uh, with Bitcoin, you have something that's a store of value. But then you know, unlike a Picasso, and then even more so than say you know stock and things like that, uh, it, it's liquid, fungible, and a bare asset, self custodyable. So you can. It, it's basically designed in such a way that you can trade the store of value uh, for other things rather easily. Uh, and so I think it has better characteristics of money than many other things. They are desirable characteristics, but the fact that something's fungible and divisible doesn't make it money. One has to distinguish between the characteristics we would like to see in money that we think are desirable and what it is that makes something money. They aren't the same thing. Uh, so you have monies that have poor characteristics and you have non-monies that have good potential monetary characteristics. That being money is a market phenomenon. Money is a market phenomenon. That is, whether something's money or not is not a function of what its physical characteristics are. It's a function of what people do with it. And therefore, when we want to know if something's money, we can't simply look at it and say, well, it's got this physical feature or that physical feature. It's capable of this, capable of that. We must ask, who is doing what with it? And particularly, we have to ask, how easy is it for you to walk into the store next door and buy what you want offering this stuff? That's a market 
characteristic, not a physical characteristic. The way I would, the way I would phrase it is that, um, so I agree with that, but I would say that the physical characteristics eventually dictate what the market does with it. For example, shells were money back when, you know, tribes had similar levels of technology and basically nobody could cheat the system. But once someone comes and invents metal tools and, you know, industrial revolution, you know, anybody who's still trying to use shells as money is going to have a really bad time because yeah. there's, a, there's other people that can then rapidly expand the supply of your, your money and you're going to get wrecked essentially. Um, and so, you know, properties eventually dictate market use. And so that's why you want to both take into account the properties of something, but then also identify, you know, you look for market signals. Is this thing actually being used as money? Is the trend higher or lower? What's its current relative value compared to money? And so, you know, that's why a Picasso is just never going to be a very good form of money because even though it's a, it's a store of value, it's, it's intrinsically rare, it's interesting, uh, but it just lacks good properties to be a, you know, any sort of medium of exchange, uh, any sort of fungibility, uh, any sort of liquidity. You know, basically, it's it's not a saleable good. It's the Bitcoin has unique properties, uh, unlike those of any other commodity money, and also unlike those of fiat money, some of which are quite advantageous. That could make it a better money in some respects, at least, than anything else. Uh, and and so, uh, and I I think what you're mentioning about the fact that it's a base money that can mo move electronically, as it were, anywhere quickly. Uh, is one of those unique characteristics. There's nothing else quite like it. Well, nothing before before uh, the crypto uh, innovations. But um, but on a different related point, it isn't necessarily the case that a technologically superior money necessarily displaces a technologically inferior one. Let's take the case of, fit, of fiat money versus gold. Now, it would be nice if what had actually happened was that the greater, the actual advantages of fiat money, the fact that it was more reliable, that people preferred it, was what made fiat money take the place of gold. But that isn't what happened. Uh, right. What happened was governments reneged on their commitments, having established central banks in most cases. And lo and behold, people found they couldn't have their gold, even though they still wanted it. And I'm not, I'm not at this point going to launch into a debate about whether this was avoidable or not, or whether we're better off after all with fiat. Well, we all know that economists can uh, uh, debate the pros of fiat money uh, versus gold forever. But um, the point is that this was not a simple question. This wasn't a story of how there was a new market innovation called fiat money. And the, the, the people said, oh, we like this better, and therefore we're going to do that. And the reason this doesn't happen, it doesn't, things don't happen that way with monetary selection, is partly because governments are involved, of course. <laughs> and so they tend to have their way, with whatever the people want. But, but oh, it's I also the case that an entrenched fiat money is very, or any entrenched money is very hard for a rival, even if it has technological advantages to displace. We need to talk about this. I won't go on, but we need to talk about this network effects feature of money that makes technological innovation a very uphill battle uh, in, in monetary standards. Uh, isn't Bitcoin just an NFT, a non-fungible token with a fixed count? Well, non-fungible basically means it's non-fungible, whereas Bitcoin is pretty fungible. There's actually different degrees of fungibility, right? So, for example, individual UTXOs are, are moderately fungible. Um, they're still somewhat trackable. Um, do we ever describe it? I think that's, that's a way to describe it for people that generally promote other blockchains. And the challenge there is that NFTs are generally running on blockchains that are pretty centralized. And so, in many ways, I would describe... A lot of those systems, including the NFTs that run on them, is a form of fiat, essentially. You're still using a rather centralized ledger. So I would say that I would not describe Bitcoin as a as an NFT. Uh, instead, I would describe it as, out of all the cryptocurrencies that exist, it's the one that is, is most optimized for true decentralization. I don't believe that it's a tulip mania thing. <laughs> I don't believe that Bitcoin is really worthless. I got lumped in with people who make statements like that because of my much more modest, moderate uh, 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 concerns about Bitcoin. Um, 
I really honestly uh, don't have a strong opinion about where the price of Bitcoin is going, except to say that I think it's foolhardy for people to dismiss Bitcoin as something that's bound to collapse uh, any time or uh, to be overly optimistic about it going to 100,000 or 200,000 or any number of other large numbers that we hear bandied about. Uh, but I don't pretend to know whether it's more likely to head in one direction than in the other. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Lynn Alden and George Selgin. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.